Okay, I want to start back at um, Apolucrosis for a minute. I can't get the... Wow, in this 64-bit machine, I can't even see the... the I can't even access the, the menu. That's kind of a problem. Um, but I won't be doing too many of these on this machine for long. What I want to focus on is I'm coming back here to 870, and I was talking about all the trees for the protection of doctrine so you can vote with your feet. If you've got many countries you can go to, then if one country is nasty to the Jews or the Christians or both, because if you're nasty to the Jews, you're going to be nasty to the Christians. Okay, seriously, Bible interest evokes a need, a desire, a recognition, hello, Jesus Christ is Jewish, we want to be nice to the Jews. I don't, I, you know, how anybody can conclude anything else, I don't even know. But if you're interested in Bible, you have a, another interest, reason to be nice to the Jews. Hello, God caused Jews to write the Bible. All right? And especially the Old Testament. Because Hebrew was not a very commonly taught language, even during this time. So, Charlemagne invited all the Jews in. They came. It helped that... Israel was breaking up under the Arabs because they were fighting with each other, so that gave you a chance to flee. And we already talked about that on the warning text about that. And it's breaking up again. This is going to periodically happen throughout um, this time. And so now, ooh, let's go to the other trees, the other nations. Okay? Now, I said here with the word apolutrosis, which technically means redemption. Oh, worship. Yeah, well, when you're redeemed, okay, you want to, you, you're set free, so you can worship, okay? Now, what's interesting here, and it bug, bugged me at first, is that why isn't this seven here, but it's seven here? Because usually you don't seven the start of a new paragraph. This is the start of a new paragraph, Kai Ipen. Okay, just like it was the start of the new paragraph that was beginning in verse 19, or no, 32, of Matthew 24. I think it's, I can't look at it now, because in this recording, I can't call it up. Um, <clears throat> but the point is, is that this is the beginning of a new paragraph, and typically speaking, you don't find a sevening happen at the beginning of a paragraph. But when you look at the wording, it's... It's doing double duty as the ending of a paragraph. Because the message of the fig tree is that you know redemption is near. Well, he just finished saying that up here. Christ didn't say it in this order. Okay? Luke is reordering the words. Okay? Because he's doing the timeline of church. So, parable of the fig tree is sort of like a concluding statement to the foregoing as well as the introduction of what's coming here in the next sentence, which is, you know, you know that summer's near for 870, which is 900 AD, which is where I stopped the last increment. Now, why is that so important? I mean, this is, this is really flowery language. It's put down here rather than in the same place that it is in Matthew 24. And we know that Matthew's syllabification was being tracked. I mean, and it, you'll see it again at the end of the Luke passage. So he's taking it out of order deliberately, and that's because of the timeline. See, like I said, when I first started this, I kept asking God, why are these words in a different order? Why is, this, why is each gospel telling only certain things in order? And then it's like, it differs. And of course, scholars have been arguing for, about that for centuries. Well, I submit to you this is the answer. Because the passages are metered to tell you a timeline lesson or a doctrinal lesson where the sevening is so important to the lesson that they reorder the words. And they expect you to know the original order in order to get the play on the change in the order like here. In Matthew, you don't have the words and all the trees. You just have learned the parable of the fig tree. Okay, so either he said it a second time, 
where Matt, uh, Luke is adding these words here to make application from it. It's called interpretive quoting. Okay. So 870 and a 91 means it's a real important benchmark. The 91 in particular. It's saying God's will has gotten completed. Everything he designed it to happen. And now there's going to be a rough next seven patch. Because God got what he wanted, and you know, Satan's going to respond. All right? And seven is always, you know, tribulation, passion week. That evokes that kind of meaning. So then the next seven syllables are kind of important. So what are they? Before we get to the end of 900 where I stopped last increment. Jotan parabalosin. Jotan probalosin. Hotan probalosin. Okay, so that's six syllables. Ide, so it's in the middle. Ede, hede, ede. Okay, so it's basically when you see, alright, when you see the shoots start, then you know that summer is near. Okay, shoots. You see the start of something. Well, <clears throat> oftentimes we don't see the start of something without, what do you want to call it, pressure? You see the start of your muscles grow when you exercise, but the exercise itself is not pleasant. So something grows out of, you know, when a seed sprouts. It's a struggle for the, for the new plant. First of all, the outer shell of the seed has to soften enough that the shell can break out. Then it has to struggle up through the soil in order to get to the sun. And it has to have enough water the whole time in order to actually even be able to do that. God builds struggle into everything. I hate it, but that's the way it is. So there's a period of struggle, but it's not so bad that you don't see. Okay? That's blepo, to see, to look at, to, to behold, okay? Behold, you're going to see, all right, through what's coming out, through the, the shoots coming out of the bark, all right? So it's a struggle time. So the period from 870 to 80, to 900 AD is starts with a period of trouble but you see results okay that first period of struggle where you start to see the results and you know that summer is near summer is a metaphor of war because that's when kings go to war that's when the temple went down okay there's a 30 year period here it's not a 7 and then there's a 34 and that's not a 7 either and then there's a 26, and that's not a 7 either. Okay? So this whole next phase is not a 7 until it gets here. This is what's really fascinating about this period of history. Roughly from 870 A.D. until down here. See where it's 1008? I did my syllable counts right, and I did check it, but I didn't check for variance, so maybe you will. Um, this is 1038 A.D., and the total is 168, which is a prominent meter in Matthew. 1068, uh, 168 is eight, 84 times 2. So it's kind of a long period from 870 A.D. to 1038. And there's no one particular growth that occurs in a group. And yet, this is what's so interesting about it, and yet the total is 284. God's will being done. Not complete yet, but being done. God's decree. There's a decree that's being carried out. So all of this text, from verse 30... To verse 34 is basically underground like a seed okay that's why probalon 
Probalocene is so important here that there's sort of keyword for the period. It's all below deck. That means a whole lot of individuals. Individuals, not groups. Individuals. When you see seven numbers like 42, it's talking about groups. Groups. This is a bigger group, doubles the size of this group. Okay? And that is, is like it buys the whole period, 91. <clears throat> Those could have been a few people in number, but they grew a lot. The growth, the intended growth occurred. Okay, whereas here, you got a growth period, and then if there's growth, there are individuals here, and yet that's a 91. Okay? From 749, the last time it's seventh in the accumulation, to 91. So we got individuals growing in here. Individuals, not groups. And it's so good that this is a 91, and this is a double 84. Now, if you go look in history, and again, we're still talking about the West. We're talking about what we now call Europe, but particularly Western Europe. You'll find out that this was a period of a great deal of intellectual and literary ferment. Okay, which means that, that Satan was rolling out, you know, man's rationalization and his ability to reason. And, you know, it's sort of a, there was a flourishing of, you know, recovery of the classics and all this other good stuff that was going on. So that you had something else to occupy your mind, Satan hoped, other than Bible. A whole bunch of people were doing that. But at the same time, then there was an increase in desire to learn, increase in desire to read, increase in desire to know. The Jews were not universally and not all the time welcomed, because this is the rise of anti Semitism going on during this time, too. But there was enough intellectual ferment that one of the things that was beginning to happen during this time is the monasteries were becoming great centers of learning. They were somewhat influenced by that going on in Spain, which, you know, the Arabs Christianized, essentially. Once they got to Spain, and they were actually taking over a, a Catholic country, they started to soften their Islam and started to become much more philosophical. Okay? And especially under the Umayyads. And then they start to get soft. And that's why they get defeated at the Battle of Tours. But that sort of eclectic learning together still gets into Europe. And it's a competition for learning Bible. And at the same time, because what's ever good about a thing is always the same thing that's bad about it. At the same time, all this philosophical inquiry that flowers during this time in especially the monasteries who really don't like the Catholic Church but if they call themselves monks then the Catholic Church won't bother them they start you know getting like really interested in well okay now let's go back to the Bible with all this learning we have and try to understand it and they come up with some of the goofiest ideas that persist until this day and at the same time they're really starting to actually learn what it says. Now, I don't remember the names of the chief monasteries during this time. I want to say it was Cluny, but it was a bunch of them. And they were nominally Catholic, but boy, oh boy, you had... Um, I want to say it was also the rise of the Franciscan friars, but I'm not sure I'm giving you the right names. But the big point was is they were going off on their own. They were just learning and living on Bible on their own. They were making all kinds of mistakes. And they had all kinds of goofy doctrines and ideas. And they still paid like lip service to things like Mary was sinless and all this other nonsense that started, especially in the 4th century. But they were interested in getting the people to know what the Word said. It was a phenomenal amount of Bible writing, a phenomenal amount of what do you want to call it, scholasticism. 
although I don't know that the official term scholasticism can be used for this period, but there was a great deal of it. Because when you get start to get curious and use, you know, man's systems of logic and man's systems of art and literature, and then you go back to the Bible that you claim to believe in, you look at it differently. And one of the things, if you're interested in it, you start to do is really study it. So there's an openness about this whole period that really helped um, mankind free up from being dominated by the Catholic Church, for one thing, and from being dominated even by Bible. Because, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, but if you grew up on Bible, and you grew up going to church, you learn to tune out real quickly. And it's like when you read it in English, it's like too familiar, so you're not analyzing it. Bible's meant to be analyzed. It was memorized by syllable counts, and then you played with the scripture all day long while you were spinning flax or walking to Ephesus or something. It's meant to be played with. It's not meant to be memorized as a little chant that you do on Sunday. And that's what the church had sort of fallen into. And the monks were still doing their chanting, but they spent time analyzing. And some of our best manuscripts come from this period, too. So 168. It's not over yet. But God's decree is being, how do you want to call it, enacted. Not over, enacted. And then look at the results. Okay, this is 1038. So now, and I've got to cover more about why Luke stops here, because Matthew does. But it's then, look, growth, at, now we got the growth of the groups. We had individuals here. And we know that the individuals were growing the way God wanted because this is the 91. Okay, the same way that Paul ends in Ephesians. His last 91 is has no sub sevens. We had a sub sevening here, and then there's none. But it all ended up doing his will anyway in individuals. And that same trend keeps going. Individuals, individuals. You'll never know who these are. It won't be the church fathers. They're the goofiest people who ever lived. When you read their writings, it's like you need pepto -Bismol. But maybe it was, maybe there was a housemaid who was working in a monastery, and, oh my, she managed to learn how to read those manuscripts because she was a housemaid and worked there for a long time. And then, for whatever reason, she had to leave employment and they didn't maybe have enough money to pay her. So she asked if she could have one of the manuscripts, which she'd been learning all the time she was working there. That's why she wanted to work there. And I said, sure, here, have one. We were gonna write we were gonna wash it and write over it anyhow. And she just happened to get a whole copy of a whole Bible. Because by then they could produce it. And she'd saved her pennies for all the days she worked as a housemaid, and maybe now she's of course, in these days, you didn't live all that long. Maybe she's 40 years old, and God's given her really good health for 40, because most people died at 35 at this point. You know, or maybe she was considered really old, and it was like for retirement, and she'd saved her pennies, so now she could go to her little dirt hut and take this script with her. And for the rest of her days, she read it, and all the people in the village that were around her, she had them memorize it, and she taught, she didn't consider it teaching, she just passed on the words, and then someone inherited her manuscript, and that person grew, and someone else, and that person grew. Or maybe here, it was a duke who commissioned the Bible to be copied, and then he gets sick for six years, because, you know, in those days, a little disease could sell you for a long time. Okay, so while he's in bed, he's reading and reading and reading scripture. And as a duke, he would have been taught Latin and Greek and even Hebrew as a kid. Okay, and so he grew. And then somebody would inherit his Bible because you passed him down from father to son. Okay, and then maybe here it was a Jewish tradesman. Okay, and, and he had been a Jew and a good Jew and blah, blah, blah. And, and he's stopping at an inn someday to get some, hopefully, kosher food, because he's observant. And the, the serving wench says to, it says to him, oh, you're a Jew. Jesus Christ is Jewish. Very innocently, you know, just trying to make conversation. And it suddenly hits him. 
oh, he really is the Messiah. So now he pulls out his Old Testament, which we happen to have on his donkey cart on his scroll. And now he wants the New Testament. So the next place he goes, he talks to somebody, probably a monk, and a monastery is trading goods for him. He says, you know, do you have any of those New Testaments? And of course the monk is going to be surprised, aren't you a Jew? Yes, I'm a Jew, but, you know, I'll buy the New Testament from you if you got one. And so he buys one and he starts studying. Okay? That's the story. See, your life is really important. This is the story of your life and my life right here. Nobody sees it in history. But God sees it. And at the end of history, we will know who these people were. According to Revelation, each person who ends up becoming a king has a whole pillar. And in the ancient world, what they did is they carved your great stuff that you did in stone. And then people visited it and they could tell by the pictures. Because, you know, people choose to be ignorant in every every generation, oh, here's a picture of Titus conquering Jerusalem, you know, Titus is free, Titus is arch, okay, well, now we're going to have a, if this could be you, except it's not this, this particular year, this is in the past, but pretend that is 20,979, the year 20,979, and this was you. For your 25 years that you learned and lived on Bible. And there's a pillar talking about all the discoveries you learned and all the importance it was and how God blessed history because of you. That's kind of what this is too. That's what the Genesis 5 begats are. It's a kind of honor roster. It is consecutive. Okay, there are no skip parts. But at the same time, it is an honor roster. Okay. Well, maybe this could be you. Maybe it'll be me. All right? That's the thing to learn from these timelines. There's a whole lot of doctrine here that infuses and impacts the interpretation of these words and yet is consistent with them and doesn't interfere with the literal interpretation of them for the tribulation and the second coming. Whatever it was, somebody really learned because this is a 168 and it's unknown to history people in here, not a group of any kind. And God's will got enacted. It's not finished yet, so at least one of them is still alive. And then look, now we come to the groups. So because of those individuals, now these groups can flourish. 28, that's growth with some tribulation attached. 35, either stands for God's will or man's vote. Because 35 and 35 is 70, and it's always about voting. Okay? And then we got 14. That's pregnant. That's like, you know, tribulation quality. Now, what I wanted to close out here is I wanted to stress this. See this 1085? The period is the 35 years to the millennium had there been no church, plus the first 1050 of church. That's what 1085 means. Remember? Going back up here. Hi, I'm Luke. I'm writing this chapter 28 years after Christ died, which is also 35 years to the millennium. Okay. So he's right at the end of some year. Because at the end of the year when Christ died, there were 63 years left to the millennium. That's the cuteness of it. All right, well, if he's writing when there's 35 years left to the millennium pre-church, because it was scheduled to begin 94 A.D., then he's going to carry this timeline since it's about church 35 years beyond the actual 1050, which began in 30 AD, overlapping with what was supposed to be had there been no church. It's really clear that the 1050 is used. And in terms of what year this is, it's 1144, end of 1143 AD. End of 1143 A.D. was supposed to be the last 1050 of history, and history was uh, eternity was supposed to begin the next beginning of the next year. So 11 January in our terms, January 1 of 1144 A.D. was supposed to be when had there been no church was supposed to be when eternity was supposed to begin. Now every Jew knew that. So he's reconciling the timeline for church 
to the original timeline when the millennium was supposed to start 35 years after he writes. Okay? 35th year after he writes. So he's reconciling the pre-church and the post-church 1050. And it's very um, pointed that he's doing that. Especially when he ends it here with being ready to stand before the Son of Man because this is when eternity was supposed to begin. And, you know, in eternity you stand before the Son of Man. You get the, you get the, you know, the revelation, the end of revelation. The revelation hadn't been written yet, but the doctrine was long known. Okay? Be able to stand before the Son of Man. Be ready. Keep on praying at all times. That's at all times. Keep on praying. Okay? So that in the day you can stand. That's stat desimai. It's histami. You can stand before. And this is a legal term. To stand before. Like standing before a judge. Standing before a ruler. The Son of the Man. The Son of Man in our terminology. Okay, there's only one of them, and we know who it is. So that's why he ends it that way. Now you see how meaningful this is? It's a timeline with specific years per syllable that are often satirical. Okay? And with a nice little epilogue at the end, like Greek drama wants to do, just by knowing the meter. Hi, this ends up being the first meter of church. First 1050 of church. It was supposed to be the last 1050 of history. But because there's church now, it's going to start early, just after he dies. And he dies early. So, hello, instead of it being 35 years and ending at 1050, I'm reconciling what should have been the old 1050 coming 35 years after I write with the actual 1050 that's going past 1050 because now there's church. See? Notice how he's accomplishing all that meaning with just a number of syllables. And what's the total? Ha ha! 77. Jesus Christ is the 77th son. Remember Luke 3. I count off 76 sons and then I say Christ so he's the 77th son from Adam. Ha ha! Of course, 70 times 7 means 490. And of course, the Matthew passage Luke is playing on breaks the time into 490, and so did Matthew. Remember? 469 here, and he breaks it right here. And oh, ha ha, David died when he was 77 years old. It's a shame that scholars don't read the Bible, but instead Josephus. And when they tell you David died at 70, it's because they're using Josephus instead of the Bible. The Bible makes the math very plain that he died when he was 77, because in 1 Kings 6, 1, he should have been 80 years old that year. He was born the 400th year after the Exodus. And those are the first 77 syllables, remember, of Isaiah 53. See? Isaiah 53 had 77 syllables, and then 126 syllables, and then the temple goes down at 203 syllables, because 203 is the sum of 77 and 126. And then 49 syllables equals years later in Isaiah 53, Daniel prays. And Daniel knows that, because he meters what he says to God in his prayer, based on these numbers. And he makes a second timeline out of the 203 to display the man of time. And oh, there was a second 126 in Isaiah 53, so Luke uses it to show the split between East and West Church. And oh, because of that split, God's will is going to get done, even though it's getting done by individuals, not groups. And, oh, here's a group. Okay, but then we're back to individuals again. And oh, God's 91 gets completed again, second season. And then, oh, well, we didn't quite complete a season, but God's decree is getting enacted. And again, through individuals. 
And then because of all these individuals, little by little, poco a poco se va lejos, okay, now we got groups. And these groups are what buys the 490. 70 times 7, 77, 77th son. It's about church. And it goes 35 years longer because it started 35 years sooner. And then he stops. He's not saying more. Matthew goes on to 1787 A.D. But Luke stops here because he has shown you how it got started. And therefore you know how to end it. That is key to Luke's style. He always, he, my pastor called it finesse. Where Luke will say the start of something. He won't finish it. He expects you to know how to end the sentence. Okay? He says something subtle. He says something droll. And then he expects you to think through, and then you know the end, and then you get the joke or the wry humor or, or the lesson. That's what he's doing here. I'm only taking you through the first millennium. Knowing full well that the reader's going to know, oh, wait a minute, Matthew goes on longer to 1787. But you stopped here. Now, the other place he stops is right here at 1036 which is the same syllable count that Matthew stopped at, if you saw the Matthew 24 video. And 1036, of course, stands for 1066, which is the Norman invasion, which threatened the freedom of one of the trees, Britain, to be autonomous. And it took them until 1154, 10 years after this end point here, to get rid of the Normans. Meanwhile, what was the other thing that started happening here? 1071 plus 30 is 1101. Okay, 1036 and 30 is 1066. And there's a silence in Matthew of 14 years. And that 14 years is right here in Luke. And he's playing on, the words are, are playing on the exact same portion where the Lord starts to say, learn the parable of the fig tree. Now we saw that in text. Okay, we saw that in text right here. But in Matthew, it actually starts at this point. And instead of having the fig tree language, he says, Be ready, therefore, at all times praying. Why would he do that? Oh, because this was a period of the stupid crusades. And in fact, in 1071, in 1071, actual A.D., which this isn't depicting, this is 30 years earlier, but in 1071, actual A.D., that's when, that's when, that's when the, the Arab boys, different Arab ruler, hits on Byzantium and defeats them, but doesn't go to Constantinople and take over. Sends the king back, and the people are so mad that he lost, they kill him. And then two years after that, they displace the other Arabs. Of course, you know, it was back and forth with the Byzantines, too. They displaced the other Arabs who were controlling Jerusalem in 1073. Okay? So you see, putting the, his language here about praying at all times and be ready in the place where he knows the reader is expecting fig tree language, because that's where the fig tree language appears, at the same syllable count even. He's basically saying, hi, for all you know, the rapture is going to occur now. Because the Lord leaves out 14, actually. And then he begins the new 14 after the 14 is up with the new 1050. But Luke isn't doing that. Okay? He cuts it off here, and then we got 35 years. The gap is filled in by Luke, is what I'm suspecting. I'm not 100% sure he's doing that. He might just be starting it at the same place the Lord does in verse 32 of Matthew 24. 
I haven't figured that out yet. But you see the meaning? He's placing it where the fig tree language is in Matthew 24. So now he's saying, pray, 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 pray. Yeah, because for all you know, the millennium is over, or about to be over, and maybe the rapture will come. Because the rapture is based on spiritual maturation, not based on historical events. The Christian faith up or down is causing the historical events. Now, my pastor taught that for 50 years, but he didn't know the meter. Now I got meter proof sitting right in front of you. As goes the believer, so goes history. That was always true with Jews. That's true with Christians now. And if we're negative to God, history goes bad. If we're positive to God, history goes good. That's in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. But here you have a metrical depiction of the impact. Now, where do you apply from this? First of all, oh, all these words, why are they in this order? Because he's giving you a timeline of history. And then now you get you can get real specific. Okay, what was, pick a time in history, like go back to 779 A.D. and ask yourself, okay, what is this clause, this whole verse, starting from 707 plus 30 equals 737 to 779, go back through history now and find out what it means. Okay? What does it mean? And then, of course, in Matthew, because Luke doesn't go far enough, um, in Matthew 25 videos, we're going to see, or you will have seen already by the time this is posted, how does the Lord cover our time? Because it's in Matthew 25, 9. Preview of coming attractions that the videos aren't posted. Hopefully this helped you understand the value of the meter. Peace out.